and the teacher started writing six uh, million dead at, in the Holocaust. And uh, when he finished writing Holocaust, there was this one kid in the back of the class where he started applauding. So I was completely outraged, you know, so I turned around real fast and I scream at him, what are you doing? But really strong, you know. But he stopped right away, All the whole class turned around and basically what happened is the same thing as my dad did. I just sat back to my seat and everything went back as if nothing happened. But at the end of that year, at the end of that school year, this teacher, you know, we were in a portable because there was, you know, this was the baby boom generation and, uh, and they didn't have enough space for us in the school, so they, we had these portables, you know, in the, in the schoolyards. So we were in a portable, you know, in our own sort of, you know, little space there. And I w uh, it was a recess period and I was uh, playing uh, handball, you know, with other students. And so we had this rubber ball there. And the teacher's walking across the, uh, the schoolyard to the portable. And my, a friend of mine, who I think was a Canadian, yes, or maybe he was Jewish. He had the ball in his hand and he pretended that he was going to throw it at the teacher, sort of in retaliation for this incident that took place months and months beforehand. And just, you know, holding the ball up like that, the teacher turned around and stared at him and stared him down. So I didn't like that, you know, so I said, give me the ball. And he was afraid to give me the ball. So I took the ball and I looked at the teacher, and he was still staring, you know. He was on the steps going up to the entrance door to the uh, portable. And so I figured, you know, why not? And, but I didn't throw it at him directly. I just threw it, and it bounced off the side of the portable, you know. So I threw it, and it bounced off the side of the portable, you know. Mm -hmm. This teacher went ballistic, you know. And he started running after me. So first of all, he went and he, he grabbed the ball, and he was going to throw it at me. So I took off, but he was a very tall guy, and uh, and he was able to run faster than me. So I was trying to, dive, you know, find a way to escape from this guy, you know. And so I ran behind the portable, and I was running down the uh, the space between the portable and the fence, and he was following me, and then he was catching up to me, and so I was accelerating, and so before I could get away, he threw the ball at me and hit me. And then, like, again, you know, just pretended that nothing was happening. But I think the question is, a, is an interesting one, the fact that there's all these undercurrents because you're describing all of these tensions and people pursuing you and all kinds of things being said, and yet there is a complete silence both within your community, so there's all these undercurrents going on, and yet nothing overt, no one making sense, no one making reference. Oh yes, it became quite a, a problem, you know, because there was a, a neo-Nazi in Toronto who started to make propaganda against the Jewish people. He was a Holocaust denier, explicit Holocaust denier. And uh, he was, uh, he's in a, a, a prison in Germany now because he was finally deported from Canada. However, he was a German citizen um, seeking uh, immigrant status in Canada. And somehow it took like 20, 25 years for him to be deported from Canada. And even though there was this law created, you know, against the propagation of hatred, he was never successfully charged with this law. And he went on and on and on, you know, and he was getting all sorts of media attention. And whenever he got interviewed on the media, there was never, you know, a Holocaust survivor who was presented, you know, to counter what he was saying. He was just given free reign in the media. I couldn't believe it. And he was holding demonstrations, and he had a whole gang of people, you know, around him who would go and demonstrate and all this sort of thing, making him out to be a hero because he was being charged under some sort of other thing, disturbing the peace or something, you know, some minor sort of infraction. That was really uh, impossible to take. So you were how old? This, you're still in Toronto at this time, growing up when this... This, that phenomenon of the neo-Nazis, you know, started mm -hmm. when I was about... 13, 14, yeah. And again, there was no context to talk about that this year, just picking up on your own through the media or through, but no one's 
actually helping you, or even in the bar mitzvah club, this is nothing that's in any way being No, the bar mitzvah club, it, uh, it, it folded, you know, after, after the that, battle, yeah, it just stopped. <laughs> no, we didn't have any sort of, you know, And then uh, you stopped going to the synagogue, so I'm just trying to situate you within Synagogue, you know, growing. fell apart too, you know, because, like, I, I was going to the synagogue, I was orthodox until about the age of 14. I even laid tefillin, you know, for a year before my bar mitzvah at the age of 13, which is, you know, a really uh, heavy duty, um, you know, religious rite, you know, every morning, prayers. And uh, then, uh, then there was nothing. There was no organization left after that for me to uh, associate with that was Jewish. Was, that, was, our was that a longing? Was it something that you missed, or was it a relief to... No, no. Um, you know, our synagogue was, uh, well, the, our school was shut down by the, what was called, what came to be called the Hebrew Board of Education. You see, because the Jewish educational system was taken over by the political current in the Jewish community that's called Zionist. Um, and these collection of political parties that were basically, you know, rooted in the Canadian Jewish community, which were oriented to supporting the establishment and the furtherance of the State of Israel, wanted to instill Hebrew as the oral language in the Jewish educational system rather than Yiddish, even amongst the refugee population. So our school, which was a high percentage you know, of refugee kids, was, uh, the subsidy was removed from our, uh, from our operation. And so the school had to shut down. Because the language that you were operating was Yiddish, and That's they right. wanted to instill Hebrew as the... That's right, yes. Because the Montreal experience was different, you know, from the folk Shula, Yiddish was the language that continues today there to be taught, as well, of, of course, Hebrew was introduced, but the, both languages remain. Perhaps in one, one or, or mm -hmm. other schools. You know, in Toronto there was still the Parrot School, which yes. was affiliated with the worker circle, yes. which was a social democratic, yes. you know, the same as in Montreal. Jewish organization. Yes, same as in Montreal. They retained Yiddish yes. as a language, yes. But the general um, Jewish okay. educational system yes. was converted into teaching Hebrew as an oral language. Whereas previously Hebrew was a sacred language, it was the language that you only sort of, you know, study to translate, you know, from texts, you know, so that, um, you know, we went through uh, the Torah, translating it line by line, year after year. We went through the Torah, we went through the Talmud, sections of the Talmud, Gemara, and we, and we translated all this, you know. And we each had to take a sentence and translate it, you know, one student after another in the class, you know, very stressful. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, we developed a, a tremendous discipline, you know, of, of study as a result. But then it all ended when you were so after 13, uh, yeah, at, at 13, you know, I was, I was uh, still in the school. It was my last year of school. It was the, so I went through seven years of this Jewish educational uh, 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 um, uh, the Cheder school uh, for seven years. And there was one more school, that, one more year of schooling that was left in, in the school before you go to a uh, yeshiva, which was like a secondary school or a rabbinical school where, where students were taught to be rabbis, basically. So uh, um, so the last year is when the school was shut down. So I didn't get the eighth year of study, you know, in the, Jew, in the Jewish school. They basically would have taught the Torah. It was shut down. You would have wanted that? Oh, I was into it, yeah. And your parents would have wanted it for you? Oh, yes, yeah. And there was uh, a protest made about this, and there was a coverage in the uh, Canadian Jewish News paper at the time in Toronto that uh, there was a scandal, you know, that the school was being shut down. And then soon afterwards, the school, the synagogue itself, which was a big, beautiful building, three-story building on Dover Court and Bloor in Toronto, was, uh, was sold by the Canadian Jewish members. And they, the, the, um, the parents who were refugees weren't members of the, of, the, of the shul because they couldn't afford to pay for the membership. So they didn't get to vote on the matter. So the synagogue was just sold out underneath them. And the synagogue, uh, well, the monies went uh, to a, uh, to um, fuse with another synagogue up north called the Beth Emeth Beth Yehuda Synagogue. So they retained the name. 
because you know they gave all that money to the uh, to the other synagogue and they built themselves a, a, a big you know modern building up the north to which we have no access to so we didn't have our synagogue anymore and uh, and uh, what people did is that uh, during the high holidays you know various you know other places uh, apartments even were just converted into synagogues during the high holidays to make space for people to go and pray during the high holidays in September. So is that what your family? Yes. To? Yeah. So, you know, certain synagogues allowed people in for free to pray. Others, you know, charged people to go in to pray for the high holidays, especially. So. So what, what, what's the course thereafter? So you can see what the lack of ability to continue in your school with things uh, not being available for you. So that was one sort of, you know, shock. Then, you know, as more and more information came out about the Holocaust, and I became more and more aware of what I had gone through, you know, with my parents. Because my parents, okay, although they didn't talk about the Holocaust very much, you know, the absence of talk about relatives and the fact that once you became once you got to know other people, like Canadian Jewish people or Canadians, and they would talk about all their relatives and all the different names and titles for the different sorts of relatives that they had. And I never even knew that these names existed, you know, and these titles and, and how big other people's families were and all this sort of thing. You see, because in our family, of each of my parents' families, there was only two survivors. Because my mother, when she escaped and went into uh, meet up with her brother in Russia, she came back. The message that he sent her with the railway that he yes, was Yes, the underground railway. And she successfully met up with him in the forest in Russia. Then she came back with messages for the uh, resistance. And she got back into the uh, Warsaw Ghetto, you know, uh, passed on the messages. And then she escaped again, jumping over the wall with a younger sister, who was the only one in the family who would go with her. Her mother, my grandmother, didn't want to leave because she said, two reasons. One, they didn't have kosher food in Russia. And two, Poland was her home and she didn't want to leave her home. So she stayed and subsequently we found out that she starved to get death in the Warsaw Ghetto. Because, you know, the food was just cut, cut off, you know, to the inside of the ghetto. And even with smuggling and all that, there wasn't enough food in the ghetto. People were just starving to death before they were sent to death camps. And then when the shipments started to happen, they were um, sending about 35,000 a day to death camps from the camp, from the from the ghetto there. Until, and that was mostly to uh, Treblinka, to the um, the camp where they had uh, the uh, gas chambers and, uh, and the uh, crematoria. That was the main death camp, you know, for the uh, residents of of Warsaw, and also the ghetto of Lodz, which was a, a smaller city outside of Warsaw. All of those people were brought into the Warsaw ghetto when there was space made, you know, after the others had departed. And so that's why our society in Toronto of the survivors was the portion of Lodge sister. society, yeah. Warsaw and Lodge together. Mm. So her and her sister. And so then from the escaped, fathers. yeah. So they went and joined up with my uncle. And they took a picture when when they got back, you know, and they successfully, you know, she successfully saved her sister. So they took a picture, and I have a copy of that picture. I'll be able to show that to you. And uh, my uncle, though. Uh, in 1940, when uh, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, he organized a, a partisan group and started to uh, resist, you know, militarily. And this was before the Red Army was even ready to fight. The Red Army was, you know, demobilized. The generals were executed by Stalin because they were, their loyalties were suspect because they had a tremendous internal uh, divisions, you know, within the, uh, the Russian Communist Party between the, uh, the uh, Stalin's bureaucrats, uh, and this was after the death of Lenin, then there was, you know, the, the organized Trotskyists, then there was the supporters of Zinoviev, and, uh, uh, and, and there's two other, you know, dissidents, you know, in the Central Committee, you know, that had, you know, followings as well. And they were all, they were all killed off. And in fact, the majority of the Central Committee was killed off by Stalin. And because he suspected some of the generals, you know, they were also killed off. So, you know, so the, all the experienced generals were gone. So the Red Army, you know, was, uh, was, was not prepared. 
especially since Stalin had made a pact with Hitler to divide up Poland. I mean, scandalous things that have happened, you know, incredible. So the partisans were the first to resist, you know, the Nazi uh, invasion of Russia. And subsequently, the partisans were conscripted into the Red Army because Stalin didn't want to have, you know, an independent Jewish fighting force. Didn't even want to have an independent Jewish anti-fascist committee, politically speaking. So my uncle uh, was lost in the Red Army somewhere, somehow, we don't know how. He disappeared. So that left my mother and her sister. My uncle, and my, my, my father, he escaped from the uh, Lublin ghetto into Russia. And he told me the story of how he got across the border. And he presented himself to the guards at the frontier. And they wouldn't let him in at first. And they said, you know, like, why do you want to come into Russia? So he, he gave the right answer, which, which was that he wanted to come to work. So they said, well, let's see your hands. And he showed them that he had workers' hands. You know, he had calluses on his hands. And therefore, he was a certified worker, and they let him in. You know, if he, didn't, if he wasn't a worker, they wouldn't have allowed him in. What was he doing in his work uh, previously? You said he came from a more agricultural place. What was his work? Uh, he wasn't a farmer. You know, Jews weren't allowed to own land in Poland, you know, so that there weren't Jewish farmers. Um, he was a handyman, you know. He knew how to do, he taught me how to do all sorts of he things. You know, woodworking, you know, uh, um, plumbing. Which he taught me. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Oh, that's yeah. Good. <laughs> you know, really essential, you know, life skills. Yeah. And uh, so then he escaped. Uh, he got into Russia. And then when he found out that it's possible to do so, this is all on his own that he did this, you know, he came back into the Lublin ghetto and got out his younger brother, who had been recruited as a policeman, a Jewish policeman in the ghetto. You know, this is before the shipments to death camps, you know. But uh, he saved him, you know, from being a policeman. And uh, he brought out his younger brother and, uh, and survived. Uh, so there's two from that family. Now, these were big Orthodox families, you know, with ten children in each, you know, generation, you know, each with ten children of their own. So, you know, there's about 200 in the family of my mother in Warsaw, 200 in the family of my father in Lublin, and of each, you know, there's only two survivors. So that's four out of 400. You know, in Poland, 90% of the Jewish population was lost. Other countries, it wasn't so bad. In uh, Holland, for instance, 50% were lost. Uh, in other countries, it was uh, in Hungary. It was uh, I don't know the statistic there, but the only country in which Denmark it was yes. was very good for the Jews. Yeah, yes. the only country in which there were no losses at all was Morocco, where the Jews were protected by the Muslim uh, by the Muslim uh, society. I'm interested in where you were talking about your realization that the few relatives you had in your family compared to the Canadians with uh, their many, many families seemed to, for you, um, you know, you started to twig on to the fact that there was something very particular about your family's history that although people didn't talk about it, you began to appreciate that here there's only, I don't have these cousins and second cousins and third cousins, yes. this is our family and that yes. for you, that became a, a, a shock. A, yeah. yeah. Well, not that I didn't know that there was a Holocaust before, but the, mm -hmm. the dimension, the dimension of it, you know, was not apparent, you know, because we were so isolated from each other. Uh, and then the trial of Eichmann took place, the Nazi Eichmann, who was organizer of the deportation of the Jews to death camps in Hungary. He was captured and he was put on trial, and this was broadcast on television worldwide, and I watched every second of that. This was, you know, complete sort of, you know, they're talking about me. You know, I realized that they were talking about me and my parents, you know. First time, you know, that this was actually a They're talking, yes. I'm yes, actually and, talking. and this is the truth, you know, that the truth is coming out. And, uh, and then there was the, uh, the film, the, the, uh, the trial at Nuremberg, which had the segments, you know, of the footage, you know, shot by the American military of the death camps and the bodies and all that. That began to be shown in media as well. You're how old now at this point? You're adolescent. Still. Like 15? Or yes. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, um, this changed, you know, my perspective on religion. 
Were you talking to anyone about this, or you're watching and taking all this in without any... Oh, we had a gang. Yeah, we had a Jewish refugee gang. We didn't have a name for the gang, but we would meet every Saturday and go to the library to choose books to read, usually in science, physics, you know, because Einstein was such a hero, you know. I mean, you know, the thing to do for a Jewish kid, of course, was to go read physics, you know, or what other... You know, on a Saturday night. On a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, you know, when you're not allowed to do anything else, you know. You can read. You know, <laughs> of course. Uh, so, you know, science was a big thing, you know, for us. And, and it was like a competition to see who knew more about science, you know. So, so we talk about science all the time. And then a few other things. And we never talked about, you know, mm -hmm. Holocaust or politics or anything like that. But... But you banded together. Yeah, we banded together. And then... You know, I began to become aware of those political currents that did talk about the Holocaust and did uh, oppose the Holocaust. Um, but that came sort of after, you know, that I met one particular friend, Morris, Morris Friedman, who was a Canadian Jewish guy who talked to me. And he was, you know, you know a smart kid, you know, uh, who, who, you know, interested in talking about science, you know, he wasn't part of our gang, he wasn't a refugee kid, you know, but he was a scientific kind of a guy, you know, he became, um, he became um, chief of neurology at the Baycrest Center in Toronto, the old people's home, so he became a scientist, basically, and we would talk about science a lot, but, see, he came from a family that was atheist, okay, so, this was the first mm -hmm. Jewish atheist that I had ever met in my entire life, and I had been educated to believe that if you didn't believe in God, or if you gave up your belief in God, that you would die, or you would be killed, basically. And uh, somehow this was connected with the prerogative of the father, who could kill a son who didn't believe in the religion anymore. So I kept, you know, my my uh, my questioning of religion. It was as a result of, of meeting a living refutation of what I had been told. I kept this to myself for four years, five years. So I kept on going to the synagogue, you know. But I was always late, you know. My father was always angry with me because I was late, you know. Like he would go for nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. Go before lunch, <laughs> for lunch. After working until, until midnight the night before. Uh, I think he was forced to work on Friday nights, even though it was the Sabbath, even though it was Shabbos. And uh, so he, he nonetheless went to the synagogue 9, 9.30 in the morning. He was still cleaning at Osgood at this point? Yes. And then uh, I would come at about 10.30, right at the break, you know, at the break time. For the rabbi's speech? Oh, no, the rabbi didn't sermon. speak. They didn't do sermons in an Orthodox uh, shul, you know, they don't, they're not allowed to talk. Only God talks, you know, through the Torah. So they read a, par a parsha of the Torah, you know, the weekly, you know, segment of the Torah is read at that time. And everybody else, you know, goes out and chats, okay? So I come just for that time, and all the guys, you know, would come and we'd sit in the hallway and we'd chat. That was our club, you know. And we were mostly the refugee kids. And then the, uh, the, the, the leaders of the synagogue, they'd walk by, you know, and they'd look at us, you know, we'd look at them, and they'd never talk to us, and we'd never talk to them. That was, you know, the synagogue. Those are the ones who sold off the synagogue and closed down the school. This is really sort of, you know, a lot, you know, for a kid to carry. You know, I didn't realize, you know, I don't realize, you know, how much it is, you know, when I, when I, until I sort of bring it all together like this. The sense of exclusion, the continual... Yes. So it was very stressful. I think that it was a contributing factor to a medical condition that I developed subsequently, which was scoliosis. Scoliosis is uh, like a uh, hunchback vertebra. You know, the vertebra turns into a curve. I was very athletic, though. I was a swimmer, and I became a lifeguard. So I was in shape, you know. So the curve was a beautiful, symmetrical curve, you know. So I was very straight, you know. Nobody noticed, you know, that I was hunchbacked or anything like that. But I had like an accordion in my vertebra. And it kept on getting worse and worse. And I never realized, you know, why I was always fatigued and why it hurt me, you know, to play the violin. You know, I was studying violin and I would be practicing and I couldn't ever practice more than 30 minutes at a time because it would hurt my back. So then at uh, 21 years of age, finally I couldn't walk anymore and I couldn't breathe after 
walking for uh, for about uh, three hours, I, I went into this crisis, and, and they finally sort of you know looked at my back, because in the poor people's clinic at the Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, where you would go, you'd get like five minutes you know of a doctor's uh, time, and they would never have any time to do a general examination, so they never noticed you know that my back was you know being compressed. So uh, finally, you know they found that I had a 60 degree curve, double curve in my spine. And at uh, 23, you know, I, I couldn't uh, function anymore. So they did the, the, uh, that pioneering operation at the time called the Harrington Rod, in which they, uh, first of all, they stretched out the skeleton, and then they operated to insert a metal rod in there to keep, uh, the, keep the spine un, uncurved. So they reduced the curve from 60 to 45 degrees. And with that, I was able to function. However, as a result, you know, uh, of a five-hour operation, I was transfused with hepatitis C. And so I was uh, slowly dying with hepatitis C virus for 28 years. But I saved myself. Did you know? Were you immediate, was it immediately known? Or it wasn't even known what this virus was at the time until 10 years later they called it non-A, non-B, you know, hepatitis. And, uh, and so I saved myself basically by staying a vegetarian and not drinking any alcohol. And then uh, finally, um, a treatment was developed with interferon and ribavirin in 2000. The second uh, use of the treatment uh, was successful and I eradicated the virus. So I stopped the degeneration of my liver and, uh, and uh, I cured myself. So I'm not dying anymore. <laughs> so I actually survived like that uh, longer than the... Um, life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Life expectancy. Which is 20 years, yeah. So I'm a survivor in three, three times. Once you know how to survive, you know, you use the same sort of methodology to seek out a way. You always find a way, you know, to, to get yourself out of a difficult situation. How would you categorize it? The survivor mentality? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. It's difficult, you know, that nobody has ever really ever asked me this before. So, you know, I don't really have the no, words to... Because you intuitively, you somehow yes, know and move know. towards... Yes, I've never written about this, as I've said before. Uh, to explain it, I would have to sort of just uh, improvise. And, uh, and uh, first, first of all, you don't let yourself get shocked. You don't, you don't, you know, stay in a... And you, don't, you don't react by being shocked. Because you know that being shocked is totally useless. You see, it's a question of utility. You know, your whole mentality becomes a matter of, you know, utility. Is it useful to do this or is it not? That's the question. Will this help me to survive? Yes or no? That's all. That's all there is. It becomes a very black and Logic, white, uh, you know, yeah, logic is just, you know, like a matter of survival. It's like a very basic methodology that uh, permits you to basically deal with any situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you say that you've also inculcated the same thing? Yes. yes. I believe so. From your own experience and the school you went to, or just from by the education you gave me and your own and my ex well, everybody has his own experience. But with that education that I had, I was able to deal much better with all these complications that I had in my life than mm -hmm. other people who I've seen. Because of being so marginalized and so. Um, well. Because uh, I, I, I knew how to deal with these situations, you know, like I, I managed to, at school when I was alone, I, instead of just crying in my little, own little corner, I would write poems, mm -hmm. you know, or, or with friends, you know, I'd find out a way to, to make friends uh, without any problems, you know. And, I would have to find solutions because if I would stay on in my own little corner, I would have, no. I wouldn't have been able to to do any of my studying uh, uh, adequately. And, uh, no. So that's like some of my first experience with this uh, methodology. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question here. You found a small group of refugees, Jewish refugees. Did you find the same thing in Montreal? Did you find a group? Uh... Um, no. No, nobody. 
I, I never ever met any other Jews, I never ever met any Quebecois, young Quebecois children who even had the slightest idea of my religion or culture or my history or anything. I had to explain everything to all, all of them. And in school, you know, it was very hard to make friends, as we explained earlier. But when I finally got out of school, I couldn't, I was more free to make friends. And, you know, I would, tr I, I would tell them I'm Jewish and I would never deny it. I would, you know, ha expect them to respect my culture. But it, it uh, took a long time for them to start understanding. And even now then, some of, of my best friends, you know, they still have trouble understanding. They just, you know, they understand it's a, a big question for me, but they can't really size the whole thing as I see it. They, it's, uh, it's completely uh, unknown. Unknowable, yeah, unknown. For unknowable. them, yes. You were saying you were starting to name some of the things, and I don't. I think you had some more to, as you were trying to uh, think I about. I think there must be more. <laughs> um, utility. To try to name it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, uh, the second major feature of, of the survivor mentality is uh, uh, you, you assume the opposite of what is the general perception of what it is to be marginalized. To be marginal generally means that you are in an unfavorable situation. However, in the survivor mentality, being marginal has no such negative connotation. To be marginal can be beneficial if it means that you are going to survive and everybody else is not going to survive. For instance, my parents were marginal because they escaped. You know, they chose to escape and they were marginal. You know, mm -hmm. and everybody else stayed. You know, because they figured, you know, that 